Well, good morning. Welcome to worship. I'm Pastor Jared, and if you're here with us for the first time, uh, we'd love to meet you following the service and introduce myself a little bit more. And if you're worshiping online, we're glad to have you too, especially on this rainy day. Uh, We're praying that our streaming holds up. For whatever reason, whenever it rains or storms, our services seem to cut in and out. Um, At some point, we're going to go up on the roof because there must be a loose cord or a something that's been chewed through maybe, but we hope it works for you, and if not, it's being recorded and will be uploaded later. Um, But we are glad to be together. It's so great to have you um, here in person. It's funny, whenever I see weather like this, I'm just all the more grateful that people show up, (laughs) and and it shows you're determined to go on and to to be here. It says something about you, and, and that's a good thing, so thank you so much. Now, speaking of showing up, we have a lot of really fun events that are coming up and ministries, so if you have an opportunity to grab your bulletin or if you need one, we can give one, bring one to you. On the inside, there's some announcements and there's some things I'd like to point out. Uh, number one, if you would be willing to fill out the I'm Here card with your name on it and place it in the offering baskets on your way out, the offering plates, that just helps us keep track so that if you've missed a few Sundays, we just want to let you know that we miss you. We might send you a card or an email. And then if you have any prayer requests, praises, or would like some more information, you can put that in the the lower part, and we'll try to follow up with you in a timely manner. Also, we have just, we're we're introducing these new name tags. They're magnetic, so you don't have to poke yourself or your clothes on Sundays. We do want to make sure that if you have any heart or health issues that you cannot have a magnet located close to your chest. We have some alternatives that are clips that we'll be making also. And then inevitably, the printer messes up or we leave someone's name off. So if you um, do not see your name tag on the holder out there, if you could let us know in email or even on the card, we will get that printed every week. We're running, we're running some more. So thank you. And then as far as announcements go, there are a couple things I'd like to point out. Uh, Number one, we're continuing to collect school supplies for this year's school uh, uh, session, which is just a few weeks away. It's hard to believe. We're continuing the mission week at Vacation Bible School. So if you'd like to bring in some school supplies, if you're shopping online or swing into Target, Walmart, Meijer, all the sales are going on. We'll be collecting those and delivering them to some local schools in the area. You can bring those in to the church and we'll be happy to distribute those together. Also, Stronger Together is a happening on Saturday, August 20th in Lakeville, Indiana. This is a district-wide gathering celebration day of fun, 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern time, so 10 to 3 for us. Um, it's going to be a Methodist from across the North District, which goes from here all the way to Warsaw, my hometown. Uh, we'll be gathering in Lakeville uh, for a day of fun, and, and you're welcome and encouraged to attend. Finally, the one I want to point out to you that's not on here is someone, I don't know, Dan or Larry or several others that have made this great idea um, uh, to have what's called, they're calling the Pastor's Masters. <laughs> So on Monday, August 1st, I believe, is that right, Dan? Uh, 3.30 p.m. at Wicker Park, um, they're they're challenging United Methodist pastors and, 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 and people from the churches in the area to join for this fun scramble event. Uh, I believe Steve Conger, who used to be the pastor here years ago, he just retired to the Chicago suburbs. He'll be in attendance, uh, and so we're just inviting just kind of a fun, silly day to play golf and have fun together. So uh, putting that on your calendar if you're a golfer, and even if you're not a golfer, you're welcome to attend. Anything else on that, Dan? No. Okay, great. (laughs) All right, perfect. Well, that's just some fun things that are uh, uh, in store for the weeks ahead. But today, we, I do believe that God has a word for us, uh, whether it's in a song or a prayer, a scripture, a sermon. God wants to speak to you in this hour that we have together in ways that God won't speak to you throughout the rest of the day or even this week. So I hope you come this morning expecting, expecting to meet with God. A word of encouragement, a word of challenge, somewhere in between. Well, I'm excited for what God has in store, and I'm excited to be worshiping with you. 
So friends, I want to invite you, if you're online, to greet each other in the comment section. And if you're here in person, if you'd like to stand, welcome those around you as we begin this morning. I'm glad you're here. Amen. We'd like to invite you to remain standing as we join together in the call to worship. When we feel downhearted, when we wonder if we can continue on our journey, when we hunger and thirst in our souls for relief, Lord of hope and possibilities, be with us today. You may be seated. I don't remember that second line. I love that song. I haven't sung it in a long time, but I like that, that, that line. It said, Jesus swept across the broken strings, stirred the slumbering chords again. 
I like that line. I wonder if there are any slumbering hearts that need stirred today. Well, as we continue worshiping this morning, we invite you to uh, continue to worship God through the giving of your tithes and offerings. You can do that online through the mail or placing it your offering in the uh, giving plates on your way out. But I'd like to share with you a card I received this week, or we received this week, from Reverend Dr. Marty Lundy, who is our conference superintendent. I'm so proud of, of, of Ridge for the past, gosh, it's probably been, it's probably a five-year journey. Um, Ridge has been intentionally, every year, making a commitment to increase our tithe to the conference. So just like God challenges us to tithe individually, to God, so too in our United Methodist Connection, our church is challenged to tithe to the support of the work of our conference and denomination. Um, We finally reached the point where we are tithing 100%. It took us, I think, five or six years of making some sacrifices and choices, but Reverend Dr. Lundy wants to uh, commend us for that. She says, Dear Munster Ridge UMC, Thank you so much for your generous commitment to paying your conference tithe in full. Because of churches like you, we are making disciples of Jesus Christ here and around the world. The future is bright because of you. I'm grateful for you and for your witness. Blessings, Marty. Pretty cool. Uh, So congratulations, Ridge. May you continue to be blessed this morning by the gift of music and song. going to sing a song that says, Lord, make me an instrument. And uh, by the way, there's a, a slide, please, uh, uh, Charlie, uh, if you could uh, uh, skip to that slide, because I'd like you all to sing along as we get to this chorus. It's very simple. You'll know it after the first time. It's always wonderful when I have a great, wonderful instrument like this piano. It's uh, Beautiful instrument. I've also had to play pianos that were not beautiful, that were not in tune, that weren't great. But I've learned something over the years because I've gone to concerts where the musicians themselves have had to play substandard instruments. But a great musician can make a substandard instrument sound beautiful. And this morning, You may not be like me. You may not be perfect. (laughs) But if you'll put yourself in the Lord's hands and allow him to use you, allow him to make you his instrument, the Lord God Almighty can make even a substandard instrument sound beautiful, sound great, and be a blessing to those around you. The world is turning its back on you today. Reaping the fruits of going their own way. The wrong I've done, I don't have time to say. Oh Lord, do this one thing, I pray.
fragrant of your love. Oh God, we thank you for this day and the opportunity to worship you. We pray that as we worship you through the giving of our tithes and offerings and as we worship you through our daily lives, that you would indeed make us instruments of your peace, residents of your growing and inbreaking kingdom. God, may the monies that we give to you be used to further your peace and your kingdom in our hearts and in the hearts and lives and world of those around us. Oh God, may your kingdom come. In your name we pray, amen. You may be seated. As we continue this morning, we continue in a spirit of prayer. Uh, are there any prayer requests or praises that you would like to share this morning with the congregation? Yes, Diana. Diana. Thank you. We pray for Debbie Barker. Um, Sarah Nathan Weiber was an associate pastor here years ago. His wife Sarah. This is this is um, her mom, um, Nathan's uh, mother-in-law Debbie, as she battles cancer and has some tough decisions to make. We pray for her and the family. Thank you. Yes, Chris. Oh, good. Praise God. That's great. Thank you for the update. So glad to hear that. Gearhard is um, testing negative now for COVID and is on the mend. So praise God. Glad to hear that. Thank you. Any others? Yes. Great. We're praying for, for Sarah um, as she um, is now testing negative, um, but did um, contract, con, con, got, she got COVID, tested positive for COVID. And glad the rest of you are testing negative. Um, and glad to have you back. We missed you, and glad you had a good time away, a good trip. Um, this morning, 
one of the praises I had is that we got to celebrate um, Charles. It's been really tough getting everybody scheduled together, and um, but we wanted to get uh, the graduation breakfast in before headed off to college. And so Charles, we got to present him with a gift from the congregation, and uh, and and you 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 head out in about three weeks um, down to Purdue. So I'll be praying for Charles, the family, uh, Will, uh, he, and um, and Louis, uh, our three graduates this year. I uh, also like to lift up a few others. Um, we'd like to pray for for Drew. Is Mary Lou Mybeck's grandson? He's nine and a half and has a um, a detached retina. Um, so please be praying for Drew and the family. Uh, Mary Lou is going to be um, gone in the next several Sundays, being able to help the family. We pray for a successful surgery and recovery. It's a several week recovery process. So please be praying for Drew. Um, and, it's a tough surgery, let alone for a nine and a half active year old boy. So, um, so please be praying for Drew. Um, Want to give a praise and continued prayers for Gail Bizarco. Gail had her shoulder replaced this week. Everything went well. She's back home. Uh, but again, that's a kind of a, can be can be a painful recovery and a process there. Um, Aaron, does anybody know why did I write down Aaron? I have a, a, pray, a prayer request for Aaron. Does anybody know what that would be about? <laughs> why did I write that down? <laughs> Please pray for Aaron. I don't know why, but uh, I wrote that down for some reason. <laughs> and my celebration is uh, is Kate had a birthday uh, yesterday, my wife Kate, and uh, we got to celebrate her and had some fun, so happy birthday. <laughs> Lots of birthdays this month, good birthday month. All right, well, let's uh, prepare our heart. Or anything else? Okay, let's prepare our hearts for prayer as we sing together. Uh, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open our eyes, Lord. We want to see Jesus, to reach out and touch Him, and say that we love Him. Open our ears, Lord, and help us to listen. Open our eyes, Lord, we want to see Jesus. We go to God in prayer. I want to share with you why, why I wrote down Aaron. Uh, Aaron is a praise uh, because Aaron has been working in the nursery all summer long as she's home from college. It's Donna's daughter. And thanks to Aaron and Cheryl, who are working in the nursery today, uh, our, my kids and other children are, uh, are getting to have fun and learn about Jesus in the nursery, and we can worship child-free in the, for a moment. So thank you, Aaron, for all you do this summer. All right, let's pray. Oh, God, whose mercies are new every morning, Thank you for this morning and for the mercies that we have already gotten to experience, for waking up, for being able to worship you in person or online, a technology that is still new to us and in the history of the world. God, thank you for overcoming barriers and distances and restrictions. You are the God whose grace and whose love and whose presence cannot be bound or restricted. God, thank you for crossing all of the lines to reach our hearts and to bless us, to be with us, and to draw us closer to you. Lord, as we gather in this place, we take a moment to root ourselves or to even deepen our roots in your mercy and grace and our gratitude for you. As we take time silently and individually We'll, we'll present our request later, but right now we want to pause and just express our gratitude to you this morning as we pray. Mm. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And God, we also lift up our petitions and our requests. Those anxieties that are on our heart and the burdens that are on those around us. As we lift to you the prayer requests that were mentioned, we pray for Drew as he prepares for his surgery. We ask your grace and blessing upon him. Pray for the doctors that will be performing the surgery and the recovery thereafter. God, we pray for Gail as she continues to recover and as she is on the mend. We thank you that her surgery went well. We pray for Larry as he cares for her. We lift up Debbie Barker to you, God, as she has difficult decisions to make, and we pray for her health and the well-being of her family. We give thanks that Gearhart is doing better and that Sarah is as well. And God, we pray for your continued healing and protection as the COVID virus continues to spread and as students prepare for school or college. Oh God, bring your protection and healing. We thank you for our graduates, for Will, for Louie, and for Charles, for the grace and for the ways that they seek your face, O oh God. We give thanks and praise and ask your blessing upon them. God, there are so many other petitions, and so we take time now to lift up what's on our heart or to do the work of intercession, praying for others on their behalf as we lift them up to you in prayer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And finally, God, as we look outward and beyond our own immediate context in our own local church, we're becoming increasingly aware of how school, this new school year is approaching quickly. God, for all of those workers and families and students who are preparing for a new year, we pray that your continued refreshment would be on them as they look ahead to the coming weeks and to this new school year. God, we especially pray for those who are most vulnerable, those who do not have easy access or the ability to be able to purchase the things that they need. God, may the work of our congregation and those around our area help to support and care for those in our area meeting their immediate need. And God, may you also guide and direct us in ways that help pull the levers so that one day there will no longer need to be school drives and back-to-school supply drives. God, may we continue to become increasingly a church that cares for the immediate need and a church that goes about creating and changing systems toward justice and shalom for all. We pray that your very good kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven as we join together praying the prayer Christ taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Open our eyes, Lord. We want to see Jesus. To reach out and touch him and say that we love him. Open our ears, Lord, and help us to listen. Open our eyes, Lord, we want to see Jesus.
Today's reading is from Zechariah 9, chapters 11 through 12. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore to you double. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Marie. It, it continues to throw me off to have you be liturgist in this service, because lately Marie has been um, liturgist for the contemporary service. So every time I've seen her this morning, I've panicked a little bit that I overslept or that I, you know, I'm in the wrong service. So <laughs> it's good to have you here also. Well, let's go ahead and pray one more time as we prepare to look at uh, the book of Zechariah. And specifically, we're going to be honing in on, on, these, on these two verses, really one of the verses, as we take a uh, kind of a zoom-in approach this morning, a zoom-in and a zoom-out. We'll see it together, but let's pray. Um, Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Oh God, may the words that are my own fall on deaf ears, but the words that are spoken through me that come from you, oh God, may those take root in our lives so that our lives might become more like the life of Jesus Christ, your son, God, the second person, our Savior, and our Redeemer. In his name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, this week, or this summer, we're, we only got one, one week left of this series, but we've been looking at the, the minor prophets and the Bible, and uh, I don't know about you, but I, I found this series to be really interesting. Um, I've talked to some people who say, I've never even heard of half of these books, or um, others who say, wow, you're really kind of uh, pushing the envelope. Have you gotten any sternly, read it, uh, sternly, cer sternly written emails or letters? And I say, well, actually, surprisingly not. It kind of actually has me worried that I haven't gotten too much. Uh, but but the, the prophets are, I mean, it, they're Aren't they something? I mean, they, they, it is wild to read some to, to, to read some of these texts, and and Zechariah is no different. I don't know if any of you happen to read Zechariah recently, or if you're going to this week. It is one of those books, kind of like Daniel or even the Book of Revelation, that's full of, to be honest, quite confusing imagery and vision, it, and at times it can even be kind of scary. It's one of those books that people like to make art over that have these wild pictures. When I was a child, one of the things I looked forward to most about the church I was going to is there was a guy who would give uh, some of the kids uh, these Bible trading cards. This is the time when I loved collecting basketball cards. Uh, Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen, and Fernie Hardaway, one of my favorite players. But I also like collecting these Bible cards. And these some in the pack were my favorites were these ones with these wild images and visions. We're going to talk a little bit about those, but more specifically, I'd like for us to look at chapter 9, verse 12. So if you have your bulletins, I want you to circle the word hope, or if you're bringing your own Bibles, it's okay to write in your Bibles. It's not a sin. Uh, I will say if you're using one of the pew Bibles, though, maybe don't write in those. Um, I, I think I'll get some pushback from the worship committee next time we meet. Uh, but uh, if you have yours, circle that word hope, because we're going to be focusing on chapter 9, verse 12, when the prophet is speaking on behalf of God to God's people, return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. This is one of the favorite verses and quotes that our own Bishop Julius Trimble likes to recite to Methodist congregations and pastors throughout the state. You prisoners of hope, prisoners of hope. It's a powerful image and, and, and word here. I'd like for us to, uh, to look as we continue zooming in, thinking about maybe using a microscope and looking in on this word hope. In the Bible, as we're talking about this Bible study series that we're in, looking at it a little differently, there's this word called tikvah, tikvah in Hebrew that means, you can read it, hope or expectation. There's even a couple of places where it's translated a cord or a rope. But the word tikvah is the word of hope. Return to your fortress, your stronghold, O prisoners of tikvah. This is the word we're looking at today. And I wonder this morning if anyone here could use a word of tikvah, a word of hope. 
I wonder if there's anyone here who, maybe your more honest moments, has felt a bit hopeless. If there's anyone here who has, in the last several years, just felt completely overwhelmed by the waves and the whirlwind and the storms that just seem to crash wave after wave after wave. How are we supposed to make sense of all that's going on? Maybe you're even losing hope. It's been fascinating to see some of the reports and trends of church attendance or some of these surveys that talk about people who are reading the Bible or have stopped reading during the COVID times of folks who may or may not return back to their local church. We've experienced it here just like every other church. I wonder if in the reading or in your own experience if you felt a little tikva less. Maybe there's someone here that needs a word of hope. Perhaps Zechariah can give us one. Let's zoom out. If you were here last week, you would have heard a little bit about the importance of context. These are just some of the tools you can use when you're reading the Bible, when you're listening to a sermon, or when you're in a Bible study or a series. Looking at the context of a scripture passage is always helpful, and I I put it in bold. I don't know, it's not super bold on this screen, but um, to better understand and assess. So we talked about things that you can use, these tools of its literary context, of what's happening in the chapters and verses around it, or what's happening in the biblical, the canonical context of how the book or the word or the idea plays itself out or matches or contrasts other stories in the Bible. And then, of course, there's the historical context of what's happening at the time it was written or during the time of, the, of those who were, were reading it for the first time, what was happening with them. Like the, the, all of this context can help us better understand and assess what's happening. So today I'd like to consider the book of Zechariah, as well as these other prophets we've been talking about, against the backdrop of the Old Testament as a whole. Uh, What some might, might, or what oftentimes you'll hear me call the Hebrew Scriptures. Now, oftentimes, I I will use both the Hebrew Scriptures and the Old Testament. I've been more intentional the last several years to call them the Hebrew Scriptures because that's what they are, a collection of writings and books from Genesis to Malachi and the stories in between that were first compiled and preserved by God's people, the Hebrews, the Jews. Uh, it's, It's their Scriptures, and it's the Scriptures that Jesus quoted and read and talked about in what we have, the New Testament, the Gospels. When Jesus is talking about the Scriptures, he's not talking about 1 Peter or Revelation. He's talking about books like Zechariah, Isaiah, Moses, writings in the, er, in the first five books of the Bible. So we're going to set it against the backdrop. I'm going to do a quick flyover of the uh, Hebrew Scriptures and the events trying to place Zechariah in it. So this is the wide-angle view. We've talked a lot about how God created the world in Genesis. Very good. That's one of the things we keep coming back to, the very good world that God created, the abundant life that Jesus desires for all. That's God's wish for all of creation, human, tree, plant, animal, uh, I guess, tree, plant, same thing, but you understand, for all persons, God desires this. The problem is we read very early on how the fall, sin entered the world, this fundamental brokenness. So God chose Father Abraham and Mother Sarah, a family through whom God would bless and heal the world. The story continues following this Abrahamic people to the time when they eventually become conquered and taken into slavery by Egypt. Thankfully, God brought along Moses and the Exodus. Anybody else? Isn't Charles? I love Charlton Heston. I mean, he's a good looking dude, isn't he? <laughs> Every time. I love this. My favorite. Ten Commandments. My favorite movies. I don't get to watch it as much. We don't have cable and I kind of forget. I think it's on TBS on, on Palm Sunday, I think, or Good Friday, 24 hour marathon. Anyways, uh, this is probably the most formative event. <laughs> Dan, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I got you. Uh, this is probably the most formative event in all of the Hebrew scriptures. It continues on today. The story, the retelling of the Exodus when God delivered God's people. Uh, the Passover feast continues every year, and it's a feast, a meal designed to retell and remind and reform the people who are partaking it of this amazing story and the work God did and continues to do in freeing people from slavery, literal as well as spiritual. 
Well, that's one of the big events that happened, but then the story continues on afterwards of how they, uh, God's people conquered the promised land. There were a time when the judges ruled over the people and directed them or redirected them into God's ways, but the people thought that wasn't enough. They wanted to be like everyone else. It's one of the saddest words in the whole Bible. They wanted to be like all the other nations. Oh, and this is a, that's a whole other sermon. Uh, but they wanted to be like everyone else. They didn't want to be different anymore. They didn't want to be distinct. They didn't want to be reliant only on God. And so they demanded a king. The stories play out with all of these kings and the ups and a lot of downs that took place. If we're looking at the Hebrew scriptures, that first half of the Bible, as you're looking through, as you flip through your Bibles, these events play themselves out. And we might lump them all together in, or up into a point where uh, now, they, until they're exiled, they become conquered. We've looked at some of these books in the last several weeks of prophetic writings when the Assyrian Empire and the Babylonian Empire captured them. I think this is probably the second most biggest storyline in the Hebrew scriptures of when God's people are conquered and removed from the promised land. Uh, and their desire to get back to it, uh, a lot of pain and brokenness exists there. If we were to kind of lump these stories together, that first half could just all generally with a very broad paintbrush be called pre-exile. And then there is this huge time of exile, hundreds of years, period of brokenness, of pain, of desiring for God's kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. When the disciples are trying to jockey for position with Jesus and they are longing for the day when he will establish his kingdom and when Judas tries to force Jesus' hand by turning him over to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the high priests, they all are trying to push for Jesus' kingdom to come and to rule over the occupying powers like the Roman Empire. This exile had a big place and role in their imagination and in their hearts. But there are some stories of when they get to finally return to the promised land. They're still occupied, they're still not, they're still conquered people, but they have returned back to the promised land. You remember when we did the story on, on Nehemiah and how he was charged with going back and how he wanted to rebuild the walls? of Jerusalem. This story is taking place right about that time with Zechariah desiring and challenging the people to rebuild God's temple. So they've just returned relatively recently back to Jerusalem, still a conquered people, but here the story takes place right after their return, challenging them to rebuild the temple and thereby rebuild their spiritual lives widening the lens. This is maybe a really broad paintbrush of the Hebrew scriptures. Are you tracking? Some, some of you are like, this is really interesting. Others are like, checked out. I get it. <laughs> so I tried putting some funny images in there from time to time to keep you awake. Uh, let's zoom in, though, back to where we are in this, uh, in this where Zechariah is taking place. And to be sure, one of the reasons, actually, Charles, can you go back a screen? I don't know if I can go backwards on mine. I wanted, I wanted to point out, thank you. I wanted to point out one thing. So sometimes it helps us when we find ourselves in the midst of, of despair or challenge or, um, gosh, just in the pits of life. Like we, do, we all kind of have ups and downs, right? Sometimes it can help us to widen our lens and to do this expanded view because one of the jobs of the prophets, Zechariah included, is to help offer glimpses of God's hand that is at work and has been at work throughout history, guiding and ushering it along. We all wish that God's hand would move quicker or more forcefully at times in our lives and in this world. But God's hand, when we draw out wider, is patient and enduring, long-suffering, steadfast love. I want to pause here for a moment and challenge you to be thinking about what are some of those seasons in your life when you have seen or experienced God's hand at work? 
Zechariah and the prophets widen the lens to show how God's hand has been at work throughout history and in their family line all the way back to Abraham. But how about you? Is there a story or a moment or a memory in your life or in your family's life that you draw from from time to time of an experience of when God's hand was palpably present or moving in your life? You don't have to share that. But if you think of something, maybe write it down in your bulletin. Tuck it away. File it in your phone in the notes section. Where have you seen or experienced God's hand at work in your own life? I bet at least one of those times was a time when you did not experience God's presence or hand, and you were wondering, how long, O oh Lord, will you deny me forever? Yeah, I think this is blinking, isn't it? That's one of the things with the, with the weather, okay. But oftentimes when we find ourselves in the pits, we wonder if God's presence, that's when God's hand shows up and helps us, lead, lead us, and redeems us. All right, so let's zoom in into one of those particular instances here with the Israelites and their return to Jerusalem and their challenge to rebuild the temple. This book is set after they've returned to Jerusalem and they've been challenged to rebuild the temple. The thing is, is that about 70 years ago, another prophet, Jeremiah, predicted or proclaimed, prophesied that their exile would last 70 years and that afterwards, God's kingdom would be restored and ruled by God's Messiah over all the nations. So during their time of captivity, Zechariah's people have been clinging to this hope and this promise. And sometimes that's what we do. We just hold on to one verse or one truth, and we, we have to just keep trusting that it's true, even though the circumstances around us seem like it's, it might not be, or it calls into, our, into question our own hope, our own faith, our own trust. The Israelite people were hanging on to the words of God's prophet, Jeremiah, that after the exile, God's kingdom would be restored and ruled by the Messiah. The problem was when they got back in the land, it was so much harder than what they thought it was going to be. <laughs> when they finally arrived to the destination, it wasn't as fun as they had hoped it was going to be. It seemed like none of Jeremiah's promises were going to come true. They were having questions and doubts, we might even say crises of faith. Enter Zechariah with these bizarre visions that he has and that he shares with the people. If you're flipping through the first eight chapters, it has this what they call chiastic structure, where the first and the last match, and then the second and the seventh, the sixth and the, the third and the sixth, the fourth and the fifth. It all kind of goes in these way, these bookend matching all the way to the middle. And there are wild images, kind of like some of our dreams. I was telling Charles, I actually had a dream about this Sunday a couple of days ago. <laughs> I wonder if you've had any dreams recently. Sometimes they're relatively normal. Other times your teeth fall out or you're naked standing in front of a congregation. <laughs> Bizarre images and visions that no one wants to see or think about or remember. But God regularly throughout the Hebrew scriptures spoke through dreams and visions. It gave meaning to current context, events, and also sometimes a peek into the, into the future. Well, one of the visions that uh, Zechariah shares with the people happens in chapter 1, verse 8. There is our, uh, in the night, he sh says, I saw a man mounted on a red horse, and there were three others, red, sorrel, and white horses. They have this vision or this, 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 uh, this dream of these rangers who are going out on God's behalf, patrolling the world, as God's representatives to watch over, they returned to God, reporting that the world is at peace, how God had conquered the conquering kingdoms and brought peace. But there's this question that lies within it. Does that mean that now your kingdom will finally come? It's open-ended. And the people are saying, how long are we going to have to wait for the Messiah? psalmist writes, how long, O Lord, how long must we wait? How long? 
until your kingdom of peace comes on earth as it is in heaven. Have you ever wondered that question? It's a wonderful group that I've been introduced to the last several years called the Porter's Gate. It's a collection of artists and they sing these beautiful albums about justice and lament and peace, gathering different singers and musicians from all across the world. And one of the songs they have is called this, How Long, O Lord? How long must we wait until justice comes, until peace like a mighty river, until shalom over the land, until there's no more death and violence by guns or by speeding vehicles on the interstate going 100 miles an hour, crashing into fire trucks. How long, O oh Lord, until there are no more hungry and no more poor, until there's no more war or famine or disease? How long, O oh Lord? The same questions we ask today are the same ones that the Israelites and God's people have been asking for hundreds of years. What do we do with the waiting and the questions? In chapter 7 and 8, it doesn't get any easier. In fact, it becomes reversed. The question that the people have been asking is the same question that God then turns to them. It says, on behalf of God, this is what the Lord Almighty said. Administer true justice, show mercy and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the foreigner or the poor. Do not plot evil against one another. In this verse and others, God is turning the question around and asking, when are you going to become the kind of people who are ready to receive and participate in God's coming kingdom? Maybe it isn't we who are waiting on God. Maybe it's God waiting on you and me. Maybe God's been asking people for hundreds of years, when are you finally going to start acting right? <laughs> when are you going to start loving your neighbor? When are you going to start welcoming the foreigner? When are you going to care for the widow and the fatherless? When are you going to care for those around you, showing mercy and compassion and justice? I've been waiting hundreds and thousands of years for you. Maybe it isn't we who are waiting on God. Maybe it's God waiting on us. And hot dog, that's a different question, isn't it? And that's a different kind of prophetic book. A challenge to you and me in the waiting to do the work of becoming the kind of people with God that God desires and wants us to be. Zechariah invites us to not just look at the chaos around us, but to look above it and look forward to the hope of the coming of God's kingdom and in so doing, that should motivate us to be more faithful and more, more loving and more bent towards God's justice and righteousness in the present. To not be overwhelmed by the forces around us, but to peek our head up, to look into the future, to see the, God, the way God's kingdom one day will be and to start acting like it today. The question is left hanging out there to, the, to, to Zechariah's audience, and the people don't have an answer for God. When God asks them, when are you going to be ready to receive this kingdom I want to give you? There's this opening, this unanswered question that's in, that, that, that is still before you and, and before me. Which brings us all the way back to where we began this morning. And I hope to find a word of hope before we land this plane. I want to return briefly to the word tikvah. If you remember at the start, we talked about how this word in Hebrew is translated or means hope, expectation, and then this strange thing sometimes translated as a cord or a rope. You know, there's this woman named Rahab who occurs in the book of Joshua. She actually also occurs in the book of Matthew. She's in Jesus' genealogy and his family line. 
And the story goes how Joshua had just taken over leading the Israelites after Moses had died and they had just crossed over the Jordan River into the promised land. But at the time, it was still occupied by foreigners and God had commanded them to go and to conquer this land. There's a whole bunch of stories in it, including stories like uh, this one that kind of kicks it off and begins it. Joshua sends some spies over to survey the land. And in the city, they are taken in, to, by, in, in the night by this woman named Rahab, who cares for them and hides them on her roof under some grain, some wheat, some flax. The king of Jericho had been tipped off that these spies were in his kingdom. And so they, he sent soldiers out, including Rahab's house, asking where, the, where Joshua's men had gone. She hid them and then sent the soldiers of Jericho's king off in the wrong direction. And so for her to repay her, Joshua's men said that they would spare and save her life and all of her family's life if she let out a tikvah from her window. If she let out a cord or a rope so that when they saw this scarlet rope, they would pass over her house and save both her and her family. Rahab's future and the future of her family rested on this crimson cord, on this tikvah. The scarlet thread was Rahab's hope. It was her only guarantee that she would be spared and that her family would be secure. And though the physical cord had been tied to ensure their safety, Rahab still had to wait for the realization of the spy's hope-filled promise. There are times in our life when we need to cast out and, or to create and cast out a tikvah, a cord of hope, to hang on to it when, all, when things are good or bad, and to especially wrap ourselves around it when we are in need of a rescue line or a life preserver. When all hope seems lost, it's time to bring out your cord of tikvah. Dear ones, when you reach the end of your rope, Tie a knot on it and hang on. Franklin Roosevelt said that years ago, but I wonder if you could have gotten it from a story like Rahab's. God has, teaches us to trust in God no matter the circumstances, whether things are good or when things are not going well. Our tikvah is in God. And that no matter what happens, we serve in his kingdom and we rest in the God who deals in tapestries much larger than we can imagine, and yet who is the same God who is weaving our cords of tikvah into a greater and wider story of the kingdom that's on its way. Zechariah invites us to look above the chaos, to hope for the coming of God's kingdom, and to motivate us to live more faithfully and righteously in the present. The book of Zechariah is a book of hope that challenges us for how we are to live today. That's it. That's the landing. <laughs> Let's pray. Oh God, help us to tie the knots when we find ourselves hanging on at the end of our rope so that we might continue to place our hope in you. For those who are feeling hopeless and for those who have let go, O oh God, the great lifeguard, cast out your life preserver corded with the hope that you provide so that together with you and with one another, we might live lives ready for your kingdom as we seek to live in love of you and love of neighbor more truly, more fruitfully, and more fully. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing our closing song, a wonderful song, Savior, like a shepherd, lead us.
go forth from this place, I want to invite you to receive the benediction from the letter to the Romans, chapter 15, verse 13. In all ages, people are in need of hope. And so today, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in trusting him, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Keep on trusting. Keep hanging on. I'll see you next Sunday. Thank you.